And welcome back, everybody. It's a final session for final presentation for today, and then we'll uh, get the chance to reflect on what struck us from from the presentation. So fantastic to have uh, Dave Bad with us, and um, keen to hear what your reflections are on this this day. So over to you. Well, I feel like going last. Everyone's exhausted and zoomed out by now. So uh, if all. you collapse off your chair, then uh, I would quite understand that. Um, basically, what I want to talk about this afternoon is, is feedback literacy. And it's a slightly different take from what we've been talking about before. Because in one sense, when we, ch when we change the way in which we think about feedback from a simple information reception model um, to one that involves a process, that involves the students being active, then it makes all sorts of assumptions about what the students know and what they can do and whether they are adept in dealing with feedback. And that's what I want to focus on. So these are the kind of the, the things I want to focus on. What are the consequences of shifting to this learning centered process? Uh, what the notion of feedback literacy is? Looking at it from the point of view of what student feedback literacy is, then looking at it from the point of view of what staff feedback literacy is that needs to go with it and then talk a bit about some implications. So this is stuff that um, uh, Michael and uh, Rola have already talked about. Um, it's the shift from feedback from input to process and judging it in terms of what students can do. And if we do make this shift, then it has all sorts of implications because we are assuming a level of sophistication on the part of students about their learning that we haven't previously assumed. So what goes with it? Now, uh, David Carlos and myself, we were both involved in the, uh, uh, the Monash Deakin project on feedback. And uh, arising from that, we got exercised by this notion of feedback literacy. And that is, as it's defined here, the understanding is capacities and dispositions needs to make sense of information and use it to enhance work or learning strategies. So it's all on the doing of feedback, not the receiving therein. Um, and in that conceptual paper we wrote then, which was kind of off the top of the head, but based upon, you know, a whole lot of experience in the literature, we focused on the important things about feedback literacy was appreciating what feedback is and what it does, understanding about the process of making judgments. How do the students manage their affect and how do they go about taking action? And then we elaborated on those. So that was a kind of, um, somebody had written about it before a few years ago, but that was even more abstracted. Um, so we're trying to move it a bit more into practice. And then um, we wanted to take it a step further. So uh, Liz Malloy, um, uh, Michael Henderson and myself decided to relook at some of the data we'd collected in that project from the point of view of what students valued about feedback and try to um, uh, infer from that um, this question, what capabilities do students need if they're to benefit from well-designed feedback practices? And in our analysis, we identified three dimensions, I'm not sure what you call them, uh, themes um, in this, weren't exactly the same themes as uh, the Carlos and Bowd ones, but the first one was understanding feedback processes and purposes. So unless you've got a, a sophisticated notion of feedback being something other than a whole lot of comments you get from the teacher alongside your mark, then you can't go anywhere. You actually can't be, you can't utilize feedback if you have that naive conception. So there's a whole lot of ideas about understanding, a whole lot, a whole lot of ideas and practices about how the student is an active player. So does the student just sit around waiting for a piece of information to land on them? Or do they go out and seek it? Do they elicit it in various ways? And when they've elicited it, what do they do with it? Does the teacher know they're doing something with it? And so on. And then there's the third dimension, which is about what plans they make, what actions they take. So 
having received some useful information and made sense of it, what then? And we argue um, in this paper about uh, feedback literacy that students need to develop throughout their career as a student, this is right from the beginning of schooling to ever, um, they are becoming more and more sophisticated um, in their feedback literacy. Now, I'm not going to go down these. I've, I've got the, the three dimensions listed here. And I'll just let you uh, give you a minute to read some of these. You don't need to read them all, but just pop dropping in and looking at a few of these will give you a flavor for some of these, um, what you might call feedback literacy competencies. And of course, we're assuming that not all students need all of these right from the start, that they will need to develop them over time. And indeed, some of these will need to develop into practice beyond graduation. Because throughout our careers, throughout our lives, we are active feedback elicitors and users in various ways. So that's the understanding element of it. The initiation and participation element of it um, involves dispositions as well as other um, capabilities of being able to do things. Like they need to see themselves as a learner who actively contributes and plans and organizes their own learning and not just being a passive recipient of what other people want them to do. And then the third of these is about what strategies they have, how do they seek cues, um, how do they enter into dialogue as we've just been hearing, uh, developing confidence to approach others, and so on and so forth. So that, um, that kind of analysis, which was a kind of um, a dialogue between the data we were analysing and what is already out there in the literature um, is a way of kind of conjuring up what a, a framework or a curriculum as it were for feedback literacy might need and we're assuming that this will be something which gets embedded it's not something you teach as a separate activity it's something you kind of integrate and insinuate into uh, courses and and phil can say a bit more about that because he's been working with colleagues at deakin to do just that so what this framework enables us to do is it helps prompt feedback design and in that process position students as active players through every single element of feedback. They don't become active when they receive the first piece of information. They become active when they ask for the first piece of information or they elicit it or they seek it out. Um, we've then done a bit more work on looking at how you embed feedback literacy in all subjects uh, with a particular emphasis on first year subjects and that reference gives you know some examples of how you might do that and then currently Phil and uh, a bunch of us are developing an instrument that seeks to measure students feedback literacy at any given point in time because if we're arguing it should be developed and improved then we need some way of tracking whether that does or does not happen. And that's in the um, that's been empirically tested the first stage of that right as we speak. So that's all about feedback literacy from the point of view of the student, from the learner. But the obvious thing that that you're then confronted with is that teaching staff need to be a hell of a lot more feedback literate than they are right now. And the elements that they need, some of them on, in terms of understanding, obviously overlap considerably with what the students need, but they need other things as well because they're in the business of designing opportunities. Uh, so the second question we're looking at now, and we're right in the midst of this, we don't have anything published, so some of the data that's coming up on the next two slides, please don't uh, quote it or cite it yet. Um, so what capabilities do those involved in promoting learning need if they're to create and utilize effective feedback processes? And again, David Carlos got in there with a conceptual piece and he and uh, Naomi Winston argued that there were 
three dimensions, a design dimension, a relational dimension, and a pragmatic dimension. Um, and these are the kind of things they saw within each. Um, but that was um, uh, an armchair argument, as it were, uh, drawing upon some literature, but not literature directly about teacher feedback literacy. So Phil and I took it into our heads to think that, well, we need to look at this empirically, not just um, conceptually, in, in, in a kind of an analogous way to what we did in the previous study. There was a conceptual paper and then something which is more empirical. So what we've focused on currently at the moment is this um, empirical teacher feedback literacy study. And we basically take in from our two earlier studies a bunch of university teachers that we can say are these are the most, sophist most sophisticated academics about feedback that we can identify, you know, without going to heroic steps of finding out all sorts of ways to do it. That they have been involved in projects and they've been involved in, they've been identified as having excellent feedback practices by students, for example. So what do they do? What do they say about feedback? And what we've done there is that we've looked at what they say about feedback and their practices of feedback and then transpose that into what feedback literacy competences do these ideas imply. And then we're asking ourselves the question, what are applicable to all staff or what are applicable to those who have a more limited role? So if for, if for example, if you're just employed as a, a casual marker, then the level of feedback literacy you might need might be an awful lot less um, than someone who's designing programs. Now this is our first cut. Whoops. This is our first cut. It's not, um, it might not be where we end up, but one of the things we've done is we've tried to identify these three macro, meso, micro levels. And by that, these are, uh, these are indications of the kind of scope that someone might have. So at the micro level, you might just be marking students' work and giving them comments. And what do you need for that? And we've identified three things that come up there. And then as you have greater responsibilities, then you would then need to encompass some of these other categories here. And if you had responsibility across a whole program, then you'd be looking at the ones at the top. At the moment, the ones between the meso and the macro, there's a bit of overlap there. So we haven't, find, we haven't found an elegant way of, of kind of separating them out. But behind each one of these categories, there's a whole lot of um, statements that you know, suggest what they involve. And again, I'm not going to read them all out, but you might just spend a minute just scanning the kind of things that there are at each particular level. So what are some implications? I'm, I'm going to finish very early here. I'm not going to fill up all my time. Um, both staff and students need a different conception of feedback than the one that is experienced in the corridor. So we talk casually about feedback as if it's an information given by one person to another, whether that person will be a teacher, or that person be a peer. And the naive corridor view of feedback is the process of feedback ends when the information has been passed on. And the same applies to automated feedback. I mean, the, the, the corridor version of that would be, oh, well, you get the report and then that's it. Now, that has got to shift. So the ways we think about feedback in these very many different modes need to seriously engage with a a process oriented view, which places just as much value or maybe even more value in the things that the students do before and after the receipt of supposedly useful information. Um, so that has a big issue in terms of design. We also need to think about the, how we can 
scaffold the development of feedback literacy both into courses for students and we've got that paper that that gives a sketch of some first thoughts on that but more importantly how does it work with university teachers actually how do they learn to become more feedback literate we're very good at now at programs at the kind of entry level in terms of uh, university teaching we're hopeless at the uh, more sophisticated level you know, what you might call the master's level understanding of university teaching and that's where some of these development of feedback literacy for staff sit i think and of course all of this is contingent upon the environment in which feedback occurs so that the assumptions behind our framework and the assumptions behind what students were saying and what teachers were saying was their um, everyday experience of feedback in the university now if you then insert uh, automated feedback into the system then plausibly you would need to add additional items to the feedback literacy framework however i think there's a bit of a trap here and that's my final issue here that when Liz Lois many years ago we identified feedback mark zero feedback mark one feedback mark two we identified feedback mark one as the feedback that we understand from engineering um, that systems had to work through being continuously adjusted and, modif and moderated and moderated and monitored in order to achieve the output we need to be very careful with automated feedback i think that we're not creating a dependency on the part of students to be able to learn within those limited feedback environments so yes there's something they will need to learn in order to utilize those feedback environments that are automated but also they need to be able to cope with how does feedback work in the messy world that they're going to interact with so they need complementary capabilities for the automated for the face-to-face -face and the feedback yet to come thanks